Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Dr. Dan. Uh, this is the third or fourth lecture for American Independent Cinema at the University of Iowa. Uh, I honestly cannot remember whether it is the third or the fourth, but either way, we are covering one of my very favorite periods in film history. The transitional moment in the 1980s and the 1990s where independent cinema changes dramatically. So to answer this question, we have to recap. We have to go back and recap what the independent film scene looked like during the 1970s and the 1980s before Sundance and Miramax are changing the rules of the game. American cinema in the early 1980s and American cinema independent in the independent sector in the early 1990s and into the mid-1990s are two completely different things. So... Let me tell you a few of the people whose names you should know and whose films you should see. So during the 1980s, you have people like the Coen brothers and Gus Van Sant revamping classic Hollywood genres like film noir in the case of Blood Simple or the gangster film in the case of Drugstore Cowboy on very low budgets. I think both of these films were made for under $2 million, give or take. And they are being sold in very, very specialized marketplaces. Very, very niche audiences are seeing these kinds of films when they're first coming out. Same thing goes for films like Jarmusch's Stranger Than Paradise and Spike Lee's She's Gotta Have It. These films are framing themselves, in some cases, uh, more strongly than others, as comedies, but they're they're art house comedies. They are funny movies, not because they have a lot of slapstick humor, but because they are examining these characters whose lives are effectively stuck in third gear. So they're funny relative to other art films that people are seeing in this independent sector such as uh, Grave Grinava's El Norte and John Sayles' Madawan. Uh, this is very much the socially conscious message, message drama like presentation or twist on American independent cinema. And like the other films I've been talking about, these films were produced for a very, very small budget, $3 million like max. And they're being produced on that low budget because, one, they know that their audience is very, very small at this point in the mid-1980s. Two, they know that the low budget and the small audience lets them get away with saying things about topical social issues that other films in Hollywood or with bigger budgets couldn't say. El Norte is a beautiful film that follows these this brother and sister from Guatemala to Mexico and finally to Los Angeles, California, as they try to escape war and oppression in their 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 homeland. Medawan is an incredible film whose explicitly pro-union, explicitly uh, anti-big business is very much using the story about a miners' strike in the 1920s to comment meaningfully on social issues that are coming up again and again in the 1980s. So, as is always the case, if you see any of these movies, or if you want to see any of these movies, reach out to me. I can tell you how to get a hold of them, and trust me, that's the kind of thing that's going to reflect really nicely in your final grade, for those of you who are worried about that. A couple of books I can recommend if you are interested in learning more about American independent cinema in the 1980s. John Pearson's Spike, Mike, Slackers, and Dykes is a must-read. Pearson uh, worked in the independent distribution sector in the 1980s, and he opens the book with a great anecdote about writing Spike Lee a $10,000 check so he could finish She's Gotta Have It. So he's like seeing these things up close and personal and his insights into the kinds of films that are being made and are really capturing a very small audience's imagination. 
So again, a very niche audience, but he's like in that world. And that book is just must read if you want to know more about it. The other book I can really recommend is John Sayles' Thinking in Pictures, which is uh, alongside Sidney Lumet's book, Making Movies, the best example of a director writing about the art of directing that I know of. Um, it's all about the, mo- the making of Maidawan, which I think cost $3 million, maybe $4 million. And it's really, really great to hear sales talk about what kinds of things you can and can't do with that budget, both practically and philosophically. So check it out. Again, if you want to know where to find these, reach out to me. We'll make it happen. So that's the 80s. Things change in 89. 89 is a really, really consequential year for two reasons. First, it's the year I was born. And in fact, some of the films that we're going to be talking about are premiering right around the time that I am stumbling through the beginning stages of life. So that's reason number one why it matters. Uh, The second reason, and the more important reason, if I'm being totally honest, is 1989 is the year that we get the release of Steven Soderbergh's Sex, Lies, and Videotape. It is difficult to overstate how much this film impacted Hollywood's approach to the independent film sphere. Hollywood's attitude about cinema from independent filmmakers, independent cinema, can really be divided into two really distinct periods. Before Sex, Lives, and Videotape, after Sex, Lives, and Videotape. This movie, like Dollars for Donuts, this movie was more commercially profitable from the point of view of how much money invested in the film relative to how much money are the filmmakers taking out. Viewed in that context, this film was more commercially profitable than other blockbusters from 1989, such as Tim Burton's Batman and Richard Donner's Lethal Weapon 2. Those movies made more money, but they didn't make the same profit ratio as Sex, Lies, and Videotape. Zooming out farther, the film's impact is arguably comparable to Easy Rider and Star Wars. This is, these are the movies that, if you really just try to identify the films that led an entire 10-year generation, it seems, 10 years of filmmakers, to try to recapture the success of this movie. If you're making a list of those movies, you would have to include Easy Rider for the way that it sets the Hollywood renaissance into motion. You would have to credit Star Wars for inspiring every summer blockbuster that we have seen in the last 45 years. But equally important is Soderbergh's Sex, Lies, and Videotape. Every independent film that gets to critical mass in the 1990s is in some way, shape, or form trying to recapture the the outsized impact that Sex, Lies, and Videotape had on the film community in 1989. And this is really important stuff to mention because in if you don't have that, you can't understand how strange it is to actually like go back and watch this film and see that it's just kind of okay. You know, it's, it's fine. It's good. But, but why this movie? Why did this movie get to the same critical mass point as Easy Rider in 69 or Star Wars in 77. It's basically a small-scale, unassuming movie about a bunch of disaffected yuppies who have sex, lie to each other, and some videotapes involved. It's, it's a really good movie, but like, what, what the fuck is going on? It's hilarious to me that these... People asking these questions, these confused film lovers who have wondered why why Sex, Lies, and Videotape, even include the film's writer and director, Steven Soderbergh, 
who has repeatedly written off and dismissed the unexpected success of this film as a fluke, a happy accident. He has spent the last 30 years going out of his way to avoid making another Sex, Lies, and Videotape. And I have to say, thank God that he is so self-conscious and anxious about the outsized success of this movie. Because it has inspired in its own small way one of the most interesting film making careers that you are ever going to see in this medium's lifespan. Like if you ask me, just Dr. Dan, who are the most important filmmakers working today? I would hesitate half a second before I said Steven Soderbergh. Because he has made everything from big Hollywood hits like Ocean's Eleven and its two sequels, uh, Magic Mike, the uh, male strip club movie that has inspired endless debate about whether or not we have subverted or transcended the infamous male gaze in cinema that some of you have heard about in film theory or race, gender, sexuality. Soderbergh has also made socially conscious issue movies like Traffic, for which he won the Best Director Oscar in 2000, and arguably the most relevant movie of the moment, 2011's Contagion, which I trust that a few of you have probably seen recently. He's also made smaller, self-consciously artier takes on classic Hollywood genres. The Limey is a great example of this. But you also can look at his remake of Andrei Tarkovsky's Solaris. And both of these films are really interesting for the way that they take old film genres, like the revenge thriller in the case of The Limey, or sci-fi in the case of Solaris, and use them as springboards for really beautiful experimentations in cinematic form. The Limey famously tells its story out of order, and it's really fun to watch Soderbergh shuffle the timeline in that film. Solaris is just one of the most beautiful movies that Hollywood has ever made. I actually like it better than Tarkovsky's version. I know. Blasphemy. But I said it, and I mean it. Soderbergh is also uh, an early pioneer into the idea that you can release movies on streaming television at the same time as or before you release them in theaters. Uh, I remember seeing The Girlfriend Experience in 2009. I was lucky enough to see it in uh, a theater, but at the same, if I hadn't been able to go down to Atlanta and watch it there, I could have been one of the early adopters the early adopters in 2009 for this crazy new thing called like watching a movie like at home by downloading it the day it was released. That was a new thing in 2009. Soderbergh was very much kind of on the, the, the start of that curve. And then more recently, he's been one of the many, many filmmakers who has found creative fruit from working with Netflix. His film High Flying Bird is one of the best things he's done in years. It's, it's really interesting, worth checking out. So anyway, uh, the breadth of his work after Sex, Lies, and Videotape is truly astonishing, and it's really refreshing for me to see a big-name auteur like him go out of his way to reinvent himself with each and every film that he makes. You'll, you'll see what I mean if you contrast his career with that of the other big Sundance success story that I'll talk about in a moment, Quentin Tarantino, who will go to his grave being the guy who made Pulp Fiction and then made a bunch of other movies that really, really, really didn't want you to forget that Tarantino is the guy who made Pulp Fiction. Like Tarantino is somebody we can, if you want to debate this with me, email, email me away, talk in the comments, but Tarantino has overinvested in his own mythology a little too much. And it's produced some really great films. I I'll say that right now, but 
it's also produced a lot of movies that feel very much like they are trying to be part of a piece, whereas Soderbergh's work is refreshing because he is encompassing such a wide range of, of genres and subject matter and styles. It's just really astonishing to watch. So anyway, want to check out some of those movies, reach out to me. I'll set, I'll set you up. I'll, I'll let you know where to find them and you'll get like, crazy bonus points. Awesome. But back on subject. Why Sex Lies and Videotape? Why this movie? And it's a good question to ask because it actually, the film's success makes even less sense. When you watch it and you discover that the first word in the title, sex, occupies far less time and gets far less emphasis than the second two words in the title, lies and videotape. Despite the salacious title, Soderbergh isn't making pornography like the people from the conversation I had with Dr. Owens a few weeks ago. He's not making a crossover title like John Waters, a film that can be subversive and scandalous to people in the know, but also accessible to a wide audience. No, he's, he's... really in his own way making a socially realist art film kind of sort of like Charles Burnett's Killer of Sheep despite all of the obvious ways those two films are completely different but here's the connection just as Burnett is recreating the textures rhythms and feelings of everyday life in Watts circa 1976 1977 Soderbergh is using videotape as a metaphor for the alienation, selfishness, and stupefying boredom that haunted middle-class suburbia during the 1980s. Like, he is basically making a movie about disaffected yuppies who are so invested in material success and being in the right houses that they have no real feeling for each other and they can only connect to each other through videotape. The central character of the film, uh, played by James Spader, is literally at points filming women talking about their sex fantasies, because that's not because it necessarily turns him on, but because that's just he's just so disaffected that that's just how he engages with life. So it's, it's a, it's a small-scale movie. It is a small-scale movie that was deliberately targeting a small audience that likes watching slow and uneventful art films. So here's the question. You can say that exact same thing, minus the description of James Spader in the videotape, about dozens of other movies that are coming out in the 1980s. For example... David Lynch's Blue Velvet and Tim Hunter's River's Edge are both exceptionally disturbing films that are also exploring this, what lies beneath the sleepy surfaces of small town America. Blue Velvet, as many of you know, is very much using this flimsy plot about uh, Kyle MacLachlan finding an ear in a field to present you with a film noirish hellscape vision of of America, small town America. River's Edge, uh, which is by far the lesser seen film of the two, uh, for reasons that will soon become obvious, is dealing with this group of teenagers who find a dead body on the side of the river. And unlike the scrappy young kids in uh, Stand By Me, their response isn't like to come closer together as a group of, of, of friends. No, they just flat out don't, don't give a shit. And the film is all about how they just don't fucking give a shit. And so again, like these are films that are all three of these films, Blue Velvet, River's Edge, Sex, Lies, and Videotape are dealing with the same theme. And then there's other films from the same period that are basically also doing the metaphoric thing of using videotape as a symbol for suburban alienation. Videodrome is doing that in a horror vein, for those of you who have seen it. It's it's horrific, but it's fundamentally about the same thing as 
sex lives and videotape, how video is the way we connect with each other in a highly mediated postmodern world. Adam Egoyan's Speaking Parts is coming out more or less at the exact same time as Soderbergh's Sex Lies and Videotape, and it is doing something extremely similar. Thematically, it is doing the same thing of using videotape as a metaphor for alienation. Stylistically, it shares Soderbergh's lifelong interest in cold color tones. And and, and even narratively, there's a couple of beats that overlap. So here's the thing. All of these films were critically and commercially successful. They all won rave reviews from critics, and they made back their very, very small costs through video rentals. But none of them set the world on fire like Sex, Lies, and Videotape. None of them changed how producers and consumers saw independent cinema. They didn't win the Palme d'Or. They didn't inspire of movement. They are. They were. They were well received. They made. They made back enough money to justify their existence, and that was the the extent of their impact. Sex Lies and Videotape is one of these films, but somehow this is the film that becomes the thing that inspires a generation of filmmakers to try to be the next Soderbergh, and then later the next Tarantino. So, why? Well, here's the thing. The answers to these questions are a little complicated, but the basic story is that this is one of those times where a film owes less of its success to intrinsic merits, which, again, they are. They, this is a good film. But the success of this film has nothing to do, really, with how good of a film it is or how much better of a film it supposedly is than some of these other movies I've talked about. It has more to do with factors outside the film. Two factors in particular, the Sundance Film Festival and Miramax Films. So these organizations not only made Sex, Lies, and Videotape into 1989's most unexpected blockbuster, they fundamentally changed how the industry and the movie-going public thought about independent film. By making a relatively large swath of seemingly niche films like Sex, Lies, and Videotape, Sundance and Miramax effectively helped solidify the idea that independent cinema would be counter-programming to mainstream Hollywood cinema in a way that you had never seen previously. So that's a big idea. So let's 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 break that down. Let's start with the Sundance Film Festival. Now, the Sundance has become such a heavily promoted, star-studded film market that it's easy to forget that its origins are actually pretty small and humble. It starts life in 1978, but it's not called Sundance at that point. It's called the Utah U.S. Film Festival, and its goal was explicitly to promote American film. And it was headed up by this guy, Sterling Van Wagenen, who is currently serving a long prison sentence for sexual assault. This is unfortunately going to be a running theme for the second part of this video lecture, some of the biggest names in independent film are scuzzy, scuzzy guys. Arguably, in some ways, they are more scuzzy than some of the cre- creepy, uh, creepy big studio big shots who are lurking around Hollywood. Because in order to m- found an entire counter industry that could rival Hollywood in some critical ways... They kind of had to be dicks, and you ended up being one of those jobs that attracted a lot of a lot of a lot of real real douchebags. To not to put too fine of a point on it, so this guy was one of them. Um, but that's in the future. Uh, in the late 1970s, he was he was his goal was to promote independent film, and here's the reason why he succeeds, because this guy knows this guy, Robert Redford. So 1978, when, when the Utah U.S. Film Festival starting, Redford was best known for starring in Hollywood classics like Butch Cassidy and The Sundance Kid. 
But like a lot of other Hollywood stars, Redford was itching to direct, and he had relatively little interest in producing or directing any of the more escapist entertainments that he had starred in. Instead, he wants to make Oscar bait. Movies like Ordinary People, which is probably best remembered for beating out Martin Scorsese's Raging Bull for the 1980 Best Picture Oscar, which if you look at those lists of worst decisions Oscar has ever made, that is usually up there in the top 10 somewhere. And that's not entirely fair to Ordinary People. It's actually a pretty solid film. Uh... Donald Sutherland, Mary Tyler Moore are really, really great as this pair of parents who are grieving the loss of their oldest child in a fishing accident. And young Timothy Hutton, who is 20 years old, I think at the time, gives an amazing performance, uh, well-deserving of the Best Supporting Actor Oscar for that year. But it's it's a very staid, middle-class film a la Sex, Lies, and Videotape. It is very much a film that was intended for an upper-middle-class audience who wanted to watch a really well-acted movie that was kind of going to make them feel bad. It's it, That's what Redford makes. Uh, you see it in Quiz Show, which is much more like that, but the 1950s quiz show scandals, and The Legend of Bagger Vance is that same idea, but like much more uplifting. So he's, he's making Oscar bait. So Redford really, though, at the time, is seeing this independent film venture that his buddy Stan, uh, Van Wagenen is putting on as an opportunity for him to collaborate with young, fresh young talent who would not necessarily have been able to get a movie made in Hollywood, but still had something to say. And so his involvement at the start of this festival was mostly limited to this thing called the Director's Lab, which was, in, you apply to it, and they choose a small group of people every year, young, untested filmmakers, and they bring them out to the Sundance Resort in Utah, and they hang out for like a month in the summer, and they get to workshop their films with Robert Redford and all of the Hollywood buddies that he can persuade to show up for like, you know, some or all of that time. And it's, it's, it ends up being ideally a, a chance for cross pollination. Redford and his Hollywood buddies provide expertise and advice that they are really, really well equipped to give being in such a privileged position But they also get to see how people from outside of that small, rarefied world are approaching the art of cinema. So in the best case scenario, it ends up being a really nice cross-pollination effect going on. And a lot of really notable people have actually passed through uh, one of these workshops, Um, picturing some of them here, Tarantino, Ryan Coogler, Paul Thomas Anderson, Lulu, Lulu Wang, Deborah Granick, and many of these people really have credited their, these workshops with expanding their cinematic horizons and launching their careers. I mean, Tarantino is basically doing the first version of Reservoir Dogs in one of these labs, one of these workshops. And a lot of people have really praised how the people running the director's lab have made a real conscientious effort to support women and people of color who, historically speaking, have been barred from writing and directing major Hollywood films. And these are some of the most recent participants from the 2009 workshop, 2019, I'm sorry. And as you can see, it's, they've really made an effort to, to celebrate diversity. But with all of that good stuff, there are some drawbacks. A lot of people have complained that Redford and his Hollywood buddies' interests and tastes have affected a lot of their decisions about who gets to come to these events and whose films and scripts get passed along to somebody they know with a little bit of money who wants to make a film. Like, 
many of the filmmakers who made their names and reputations before the Sundance Film Festival and these workshops became as well-known as they were, avoided participating in them because they worried that Redford would browbeat them into making safe, conservative, Hollywood-style films. And here, here, here they are. Here's, here's some of those people who have never once been involved in one of these Sundance labs because if you think about it, you realize why. I mean, these are not necessarily filmmakers who are interested in making something even remotely like ordinary people. best review I've ever heard of the potentially damaging effects of the Sundance Labs comes from Jarmusch's regular cinematographer, Tom DeSillo, who, who said once, quote, it was helpful to take a scene, shoot it on video, work with actors, and then look at it. It's something you never get a chance to do on an independent film. But it was the first time I heard plot point A does not intersect with plot point B at the right page. I said, I'm sorry, what's a plot point? Everyone was saying to me, this is not a screenplay. It was insane, destructive, and negative. It was, this is how you get to Hollywood. I never had any interest in doing that. It really pissed me off. End quote. So that's the downside for some people to these these director's labs and sun. Robert Redford's decision to bring his Hollywood buddies to workshops and pass along advice to young filmmakers. But here's the thing. There are a few people who have wanted to use this this opportunity as a springboard to Hollywood. And the two people that we're going to have to talk about for the next part of the lecture are Harvey Weinstein and his little brother, Bob two of the most successful exploiters of the Sundance Film Festival who have ever been involved in the film industry. These two guys, if Soderbergh's Sex, Lies, and Videotape changes the the yardstick for independent filmmakers, these guys are on a two-man crusade to prove that independent films can be as profitable or more profitable in some ways than big-budget Hollywood blockbusters. So I should mention at the outset that most of my information about the Weinstein brothers and Miramax comes straight from Peter Biskin's 2003 book, Down in Dirty Pictures, which should really be subtitled How and Why Harvey Weinstein Became Such an Asshole, for it spends close to 500 pages telling you about how terrible he was to be around, how terrible he was to work with, how abusive he was to virtually everybody who came into his life. And it is a page turner because you cannot avert your eyes from this horrible man who is doing so many horrible things, but at the same time is putting out a lot of really great movies. And it just it just ends up being this thing that sucks up so much of your attention. It's it's crazy. It's crazy. You should you should read it. It's so good. But anyway, so Harvey Weinstein's name has now become synonymous with the hashtag Me Too movement. And I like I said, a lot of these people are scuzzy scuzzy guys. Scuzzy, scuzzy guys. That helps them get ahead in life, it seems. Or at least it helped them get to a certain point before the wheels of justice thankfully did set in, at least in these two cases. But anyway, long before Harvey was widely despised for doing bad things to women, he was widely despised for being a sleazy Hollywood wannabe. And when Harvey and Bob are starting their careers in Buffalo, New York, they are starting as music promoters. And it's only in the late 1970s that they start turning their attention to independent uh, film distribution. And like many others at the time, they started their careers by selling softcore softcore porn to XXX theaters. I am not making this up. This is one of Miramax's first hits that you're looking at. I am not feeling myself tonight. 
which in case the title and the poster were not clear enough for you, the tagline for this is literally a must for sex maniacs. And everyone else for that matter. This is the kind of thing that Harvey and Bob start their careers distributing. And it's worth bringing up for two reasons. One, it's kind of funny, uh, especially in light of what we now know about uh, Harvey and also Bob, uh, to see that this is where they see their first opportunities to make money, is this kind of thing. Two, this doesn't actually go away, even as they start shifting their attention to some of the higher profile releases that they put out in the 1990s. They remain as fixated on selling sex to a large audience and dressing it up as art. I mean, that's the only difference. They, in both periods, they are selling sex. It's just that in the 90s, they learned that they have to add a little class. Foreign subtitles, uh, uh, a socially conscious message, a unique cinematic style, uh, an innovative approach to narrative structure. That plus sex equals gold for Harvey Weinstein and his little brother Bob. Another thing you should know about the early days in the Weinstein's career is that they even tried to direct once. They are best known as producers, but not many people know that they did, in fact, try to direct one and only one time. 1986, Playing for Keeps. And the first thing that you should know about this film is that it was finished in 1984 and sat on the shelf for two years. That alone tell, should tell you a lot about how much confidence the Weinsteins had in this film. And when you go to look at it, you see why. They were still very much music promoters, in spirit at least, at this point in their careers. And they very much saw the film as a promotional vehicle for what can only be described as an 80s-tastic soundtrack that has Pete Townsend, Peter Frampton, and Phil Collins, among others. Doesn't get more 80s than that. Unless you had some Tangerine Dream thrown in there for good measure. But sadly, there's no Tangerine Dream there. So this this obviously was not the best way to uh, make a movie. And the film was complete garbage. And everybody hated it. Uh, see Dave Kerr's review in the Chicago Tribune, where he says it's like eating a bread sandwich. And the Weinsteins never directed another movie even though some have seen their copious re-editing of other directors' movies as evidence of an unrealized desire to become a director. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not, but explicitly they never, they realized then and there that their, their, their brilliance was never in creativity, but in selling other people's creativity. So this brings us all back around to 1989, which is also the first year, not coincidentally, that the Weinsteins make it big. Because in 1989, they release two international art films, Peter Greenaway's The Cook, The Thief, His Wife, and Her Lover, and Pedro Almodovar's Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down, that made more money than any other art films had done up until that point in time. Which is not to say they made a lot of money. They did. But they were big critical hits and they were big hits on the burdening the burgeoning VHS video cassette rental market. And again, on the surface, taking the films just as films, this makes no fucking sense. Because if you've, if you've seen these films, you know that they are kind of crazy, to be perfectly honest. Uh, Greenaway's film, for example, literally ends with Helen Mirren forcing Michael Gambone to eat her dead lover's penis, which has been cooked to perfection by the Richard Boringer character. I am not making that up. That is literally how the film ends. So again, taken as content, it doesn't make any sense why these movies would make a lot of money. But the, mere, the, the Weinsteins knew how to sell them. 
and they, as you can see in these posters, really play up the kinky elements. I mean, that is that is as hot as Helen Mirren is ever going to look. I'm sorry, I had to go there, but it's true. So this brings us back around to Soderbergh and Sex Lies and Videotape. So the Weinsteins encounter the film in its Sundance form, and they immediately purchase the distribution rights to the film, and they are developing a unprecedented for the time marketing campaign around it. So what they do, they place ads in major newspapers and on popular TV stations. They played the film in 500, more than 500, of the very same all multiplexes that had been showing Batman and Lethal Weapon 2 just a few months earlier. And this is unprecedented for the time. At the time, the wisdom says, don't waste money on TV ads. Just, just do newspaper. Newspaper's enough. Don't, don't play the film in 500 theaters. Just three or four art theaters in major cities. Like, that's, that's all you can really hope to do. Like, the conventional wisdom said in 1989 when they bought Sex, Lies, and Videotape that you could not sell an independent film to a large audience. And the Weinsteins were like, no, we can do it. We can do it. And I think there's a, there's a part of me that says that they went that direction because they were shallow people and they thought the title was risque. I like literally think that was a huge part of what motivated them to buy the film. Obviously, they liked it as a film, but I don't think they would have been as interested if they didn't see the title as the basis for one of the most successful and brilliantly ingenious marketing plans in the history of film. The end result was a financial killing, an investment to profit ratio like unlike anything the industry had seen since Easy Rider, which is also being made for a couple of million dollars at most and is turning in three, four, or five times its investment. And that's the thing. I mean, if you were lucky in the early 1980s, if your film made $2 million or $3 million playing in those four theaters. But, but Harvey and Bob, they proved that you could make almost $25 million with an art film. That was, that was what changed the industry. And having proved it once, they kept they kept proving it. Uh, some of the biggest, most canonical films in the Mirror Max catalog are basically Harvey and Bob proving that you can take an edgy movie that wouldn't seem like it had a large audience and selling it to a huge crowd. So, I mean, the high watermark for this, this strategy really comes in October 1994, when they are applying these same promotional strategies that worked for Sex, Lies, and Videotape to Kevin Smith's Clerks, which is not making a lot of money, but like when you, again, look at the profit to, uh, to cost ratio, I mean... If, if Harvey Weinstein or anyone else can make five movies for that budget that turn in that box office, then, then he can keep going. He can keep making movies. He, he, he doesn't have to worry about when the next paycheck is coming in. So October 1994, you see Kevin Smith's Clerks. But you also see Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction, which is being made on a higher budget, $8.5 million, but is turning in a domestic box office of more than $100 million. Like, $100 million, I mean, it is insane. It was insane in October 1994 that an independently-minded film like Pulp Fiction could make $100 million at the domestic box office. And then make two hundred another hundred million on the in the international market. Like this movie made two hundred million dollars. Like the I, no independent filmmaker in the eighties was thinking that their independent film would make a hundred or two hundred million dollars. Like John Sales is not thinking that a film like Madewan about union busting in West Virginia coal mine mines is like two hundred million dollar box office material. 
Spike Lee is not thinking of she's got to have it or do the right thing as a movie that is going to be playing in every movie theater in the country, even though the second one definitely should. Because they're, they're, they're rightfully worried that getting to that level is going to have a real impact on the kinds of films they can make doesn't mean that their films are better or worse. I mean, I don't want to get rid of Maidawan or Pulp Fiction. Those are both amazing films. But it does put you on a path at the outset to making certain kinds of films and making certain types of self-censorship sorts of things. And it's it's... This is why, though, that you see Disney and Miramax forming a partnership around the same time. It's precisely Miramax's ability to transform relatively low-budget independent films like Clerks or Pulp Fiction or Sex, Lies, and Videotape into profitable blockbusters that leads Disney to buy Miramax for $60 million. And this is a sale that goes through on June 30th, 1993. And I'm bringing up that date because I want you to know that Disney had owned Miramax for more than a year by the time that Clerks and Pulp Fiction are released. In fact, Miramax can only afford to buy and promote these films because Disney gives them a big pile of cash to play with when the sale goes through. So I want you to know that because you need to think about Pulp Fiction as a Disney film. It is no less of a Disney film in its own unique way than the company's other big hit from 1994, The Lion King. And I'm only half-joking here. I don't necessarily think there you can draw too many explicit parallels between the content and the form of these films. Although, give it your best shot, and we'll have that conversation over email or Zoom. But at the same time, like these are films that are being sold to the largest possible audience and that are designed first and foremost, as commercial products, at least from a market investment point of view. That's not to say that Pulp Tarantino did not have a lot of heart heart and art in Pulp Fiction, or that the people behind The Lion King didn't care about what they were doing. That's, of course, not true. But it is to say that they're thinking, first and foremost, the movie has to be a hit so we can make another one. So even though Disney is not exerting any direct influence over what Miramax is doing, uh, they more or less let Bob and Harvey run the company however they wanted. The indirect pressure that everybody involved with these films is feeling to be as financially profitable as possible is profoundly affecting what the company did what kinds of movies get financed, how they're made, who appears in them. That is all a direct consequence of the fact that they have to return an investment to to Disney so that Disney can return that investment to the shareholders. That is the bottom line for these films. And it really has an interesting impact on some of the films that get made on a more direct level in the sense that it really, the Disney ownership is honestly enabling some of Harvey and Bob's very, very worst instincts as film people. For example, Harvey Weinstein is at this time period earning the not so flattering nickname of Harvey Scissorhands because he really started developing this terrible habit of cutting huge sections from international art films like Shen Kai's A Farewell My Concubine, or forcing young directors like James Gray to reshoot the endings of films like The Yards. And if the directors refuse to cooperate, which, spoiler alert, James Gray did, initially at least, then Harvey's response was pretty simple. He said, fine, I just won't release your movie. 
And he would sit on these films with these directors were holding out for something resembling artistic freedom for months or, or years. And sometimes the filmmakers acquiesced and did what Harvey wanted. Uh, James Gray eventually did that much to his, his self-loathing later in life. Um, sometimes they didn't, but, Generally speaking, Harvey's response was kind of the same either way. He kind of dumped him into theaters, didn't spend a penny on marketing, and they ended up not helping the director's careers one little bit. And that's real shame because The Yards is a really great film. If you like gangster movies, it's really worth checking out. So it's around this time, too, that Miramax is also uh, splitting from and 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 really changing its emphasis. This is the other thing that Disney's uh, influence does to Miramax, or 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 ends up having an impact on how Miramax does business. So, in the early '90s, Harvey and Bob are increasingly turning from distributing other people's movies to directly producing their own films. And it's around this time, actually, that they split Miramax into two separate companies. Harvey ends up sticking with the Miramax division, but Bob goes and runs another company, Dimension Films. And Dimension really takes up the mantle that was held by New Line Cinema during the 1980s. You remember that from last week's lecture. And they specialized in horror films like Wes Craven's Scream, uh, many of the later Halloween sequels are Dimension Films products. They also were doing comedies like Kevin Smith's Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back or Dogma. And they were doing Hollywood genre films. Like they, that's, that's really, really important. Like we are really kind of coming full circle. Like they are starting out as producers and distributors of these small art films and now there is a whole half of the company dedicated to making what would seem to be at on surface like hollywood films they have a little bit of an off hollywood edge you see that in the poster for jay and silent bob hollywood had it coming but in form and content like the way these movies look and feel they are virtually indistinguishable from the films they are satirizing so that's Dimension Films. Harvey, of course, is never stops chasing that, that special combination of cultural prestige and box office success with movies like Goodwill Hunting, The English Patient, Shakespeare in Love, which is another one of those films that if you're invested in Oscar trivia, you know that it regularly tops lists of how did that win Best Picture? And the reason is, you will not be surprised to learn, it all comes down to the marketing. Harvey sent video cassette copies of these films to virtually everybody in the industry. And it's widely assumed that that, that gesture and the fact that it put the movie so much on the forefront of, of everybody's mind is the reason why it wins Best Picture over Saving Private Ryan, which was favored to win. And it's very much, this is the high point of Harvey's career. This is the point where he is getting the Oscar and he is making a lot of money and he has finally found a way to make lower budget movies largely profitable for a huge audience. And the answer is basically to make them as mawkish and as sentimental and as as unchallenging as possible, at least for the things that he's really, really dedicating most of his time and energy into. Now, that's not to say that he is completely losing interest in the smaller, edgier, more honestly, more interesting art films that establish Miramax's reputation in the late 80s and early 90s. That is, is not at all true. He, the, the, Miramax continues to produce really interesting films throughout the 90s and into the early 2000s. Um, some of them are listed here. They're, they're just, I, I cannot 
fathom a world where Christoph Kieslowski's Three Colors trilogy is not getting some kind of distribution. I, I, I can't deal with a world that doesn't have train spotting or the talented Mr. Ripley. Like these are really incredible films, like all of these. And Miramax really is doing the film going community a service by, by investing so heavily into these kinds of films and, and promoting them and using the money that they are making from their ventures into genre cinema and their ventures into Oscar bait to promote things that are really deserving of your time and your attention. But that said, this comes at a cost. And the cost is that by redefining independent films as counter blockbusters, by immersing themselves so deeply in the industry and putting themselves in this position where they can make Hollywood films in one hand and then turn around and produce these or distribute these really, really interesting films by these auteur filmmakers. It, it ends up fundamentally, as I've been saying throughout this lecture, changing what kinds of films can get made and who gets to make them and for who. The questions that we've been thinking about all semester, about access to cinema and the access to representation and access to equipment and access to all of these things, ends up tilting more in favor of particular kinds of people. For example, white men are, are much more likely to be distributing, producing, directing, and watching these movies than people who identify differently. And so even though I love all of these films and want you to go and watch them at some point in your lives, it's, it's, it, it, this comes at a cost, and it comes at the cost of squeezing out opportunities for the kinds of diverse voices and the kinds of challenging independent films that had been flourishing in the 80s and are continuing to exist to this day around the margins of mainstream Hollywood. Those people arguably have an even harder time getting into the kind of position as one of these filmmakers or one of these films than they ever did before, in part because the Weinsteins and Sundance do such an amazing job in the 80s and 90s of defining independent cinema in a very, very, very particular way. And that will be the subject of our next lecture. What you'll be doing this week is watching a film that the Weinstein brothers would never ever in a million years be caught producing or distributing Cheryl Dunye's The Watermelon Woman. So I am watching this film for the very first time, just as you are, and I'm really excited to see it. So let me just tell you a little bit about it so you have an idea of what to expect. Cheryl Dunye is writing and directing this film, and she's also starring in it. So this is a really great film for seeing an actor uh, also be the director of the film. But the plot is not all that different from something like Kevin Smith's Clerks, where you have Cheryl starring as a video store clerk who becomes really obsessed with this this woman, this black woman who she sees in the backgrounds of various shots in Hollywood movies, but is never credited or named. The plot of the film revolves around Cheryl going and looking for information about who this woman was. And it becomes, as you can imagine, a commentary on representation in Hollywood relative to representation outside of Hollywood. It becomes an excuse for a variety of warm and quite funny vignettes around cinema and about cinema. And you also get a really, really hot and steamy lesbian sex scene. So that's going to be a lot of fun. All right. So here are your questions. Uh, pick two 
uh, by all means, you're welcome to write about all three, but I feel like if you just pick two of these, you'll end up saying quite a bit about what makes the Watermelon Woman uh, exciting and special. So just crank out some words, and I think you will really enjoy watching the film. And stay tuned for a follow-up video where I will be talking to my dear friend Zach Powell about what makes The Watermelon Woman such an interesting movie. All right, catch you next time.